Good evening. Hey, uh, welcome to the Eric J. The Great Podcast. How you doing? Great, great. Thank you for having me. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad uh, to have you. Uh, so how we do things on, on, on my podcast is basically I like to start from the beginning and then uh, work our way up to now. So, uh, so uh, first off, where are you from? Well, I've lived in Puerto Rico 31 years, but I was originally from New York, lived in other Caribbean islands, the Virgin Islands, and lost everything in a hurricane and floated ashore to Puerto Rico. Okay. And um, do you have any kids? I have three, three children, adult children, one with autism, He's 28, severely high fun. And I have a 31-year-old who is a music producer and a 26-year-old who works with him and works with me in real estate. Okay, then. That's what's up. So uh, so kind of explain to me uh, basically the uh, struggles that you had uh, growing up as a child. Uh, how was it coming up in Puerto Rico or uh, where are you from? And also, uh, just things that you had to overcome in your childhood. Did you have both parents in the, um, in the household, or do you have a single parent household? No, it was both parents in the household. But I didn't realize till I was eighteen, and my father walked out the day I went to college that the marriage was in trouble all the years, and that he just was waiting for me to go to college. Oh, okay. So, so you pre, you had a pretty stable um, home growing up. Yes, I did. I'd say the only thing we really, really had, interestingly enough, was um, financial troubles. And I'm a realtor right now, and the market's really hot, and people are always asking me for real estate advice. And I have an expression, and it's called "take your money and run." It's the greedy ones. It's the people holding out. It's the people that are over leveraged that are going to lose. And even though the economy looks like it will never dive, never, ever dive, I've experienced, I always tell people I've lost millions and made millions. And every single time we've lost money, it is an unforeseeable and unpredictable event. You can't predict a pandemic. You can't predict a mortgage crisis. You can't predict, um, you know, a hurricane that, you know, better to be safe. Okay. So, so growing up, so growing up in your parents, uh, did you have anything as far as bullying or anything outside of the home that you had to overcome? No, but I, I was, I, ironically, I was a minority and never really realized it. I, I'm a white woman that grew up in a predominantly African American community, the American Virgin Islands, and never realized it. In other words, um, you know, it was always just so normal to me that when I went to the United States and started hearing about, I remember, you know, we had a woman live with us um, who was African-American and she was like my mother, my sister. She, you know, she, she was family. Actually, she passed away during the pandemic and we still support her. And this is 50 years, you know, and now we support her heirs. And um, I remember the first time I heard a, a, a negative connotation of a, of a racist remark, and I, I was offended. I, w- I remember feeling like, did I really just hear that? You know, do you know my sister is black? You know, um, you know, I just I, I never experienced it because it was just normal to me that it, we lived on an island where everybody was accepted for who they are and not necessarily the color of your skin. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's understandable. So uh, what was your passions as a child, as a child, like, what did you get into? Uh, did you play any sports and what was your passions as far as school? Like, did you, did you, uh, was you a strong reader, strong in math or what did you do for um, extracurricular activities? You know, you have asked such an incredible question because I was accepted to Georgetown University and I'm not smart. And, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm not being belittling myself. I really never could get academics. You know, I would study, I would highlight, I would outline, and I was a strong C student. The reason I got into Georgetown is they take people from all parts of the world. So I happened to fill a quota. I didn't, I didn't go because we couldn't afford it. But 
I always kind of used my talents and my gifts to overcome my academic weakness. Um, I'm trying to read more. I'm a very slow reader. Um, so that was my biggest challenge. But one of my passions as a child, and I feel like God has told me to do something with this for years, for years, and I'm reading a book now on getting things done, is I always loved making money. I always loved, I mean, I started at age eight, you know, selling um, cards door to door, Christmas cards, greeting cards. Then I parlayed into babysitting at age 10, 11, 12. I got my first real job at a McDonald's at 14. And what I loved about making money to this minute, I have a hard time spending money on myself. But what I love about making money is serving. You know, if some if there's a need, it, you, you can take care of it. If there's a funeral, you can take care of it. I love, love giving, 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 uh, you know, I've bought people houses. I've bought people, you know, just taking care of medical bills, giving people huge amounts of cash when they're in trouble. And there's a part of me that just loves that. But what God has put on my heart these days is, uh, you, Molly, you have to teach them to fish. You're not going to give them the fish anymore. You're going to teach them to fish. And you know something, Eric, these days with the power of the internet, anybody, anybody with an idea can make a thousand a week. Yeah, yeah. Especially with the with the pandemic, because the pandemic really undercovered the real go-getters. Like, because you have to be real creative on if you had a, a business or anything that you had going. And it was smooth selling before the pandemic. And the traffic is kind of slowed down because people staying at home or people just going to work and going straight home. They're not just bouncing around and interacting with people like they would usually do in a normal situation. So if you was a, a entrepreneur that never thought outside of the box, then the pandemic really challenged you to get creative on how you could still uh, generate the same type of income with, uh, without losing any any traction. You, you know something? I, 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 I look back on the, the early days of the pandemic and I call them the best days of my life. Meaning we all have all these things bombarding us. We have weddings to go to. We have dinners to. We have business appointments. We have to go, 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 go. And this was a forced time to be to to reflect on your life, to to learn how to work smart and not hard, you know. I worked on my phone most of the time, and it just taught me that we don't have to go go go. And one of the things I take away from it is I'm a realtor, and anybody that ever wanted to see a house, I'm like, okay, right now, right now. It kind of that fear, that fear that if I don't show it to them right now, they're going to get something else. And now I work every single day from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and I tell all my clients. I have I have time available between 10 and 2 tomorrow. What time is good for you? 94% of the time. I mean, there's a real rare one that says, well, I can't, I have to do it after work and I accommodate them. But I, I what I'm saying I learned is I learned to control my time. Yeah, time is the most important asset of anything that you do in life. Like a lot of people value money, but time is the most important, more important than money just because you don't know how long are you going to be here on this earth? So you have to maximize each day because you never know what can happen. That's right. And, you know, one, one of my passions is faith because we do so much, Eric, out of fear. We do so much. We don't even realize how much we do out of fear. I'm going to give you this example of this one young lady. She's dynamic preschool teacher, dynamic. Um, she's not even 30 years old. She's 27. And they weren't paying her not even maximum a thousand dollars a month. The girl couldn't move out of her home. You know, the government was giving a thirty-five thousand dollar incentive to teachers to buy a house. She couldn't even utilize the money because she didn't have the rest of it to buy the house to buy anything. And she just quit her job, and her mother went ballistic. Her mother's my very good friend. You know, are you nuts? Your health insurance, your health insurance, your health insurance. Well, this little girl went and bought private health insurance, went on the road with a friend, and now she's a social media manager. 
And her, her health insurance is fortunately very super inexpensive in Puerto Rico. It's $150 a month. So you were going to sacrifice the best years of your life for an insurance plan. Yet we do that and we do it because other generations before us have told us, you better do this or you better get a secure job or you better not break that mold. And it takes a strong connection to yourself and to God to say, you know what, I'm going to break free. I'm not going to live miserable. And, you know, my son did it. My son did it. He didn't, I say he's successful because he didn't listen to me. You know, none of my boys went to college and truthfully college, don't get me going, is, is, is the biggest deception. And what I mean by that is if, if, if you're going to go to college and get a hundred thousand in debt and you're 18 years old and someone dangles a hundred thousand in front of you alone and says, would you like a hundred thousand to take a course in entrepreneurship and invest it in yourself? Or would you like to take four years in a college and come out and say, now, what do I do with this? Um, you know, I just feel like it's, it's a, it's an old paradigm. You know, it was, it was a paradigm that worked once in our life, but now we've got to follow the people that, um, know a different way. Yeah. College I always said the same. I feel the same way. College is, is a, is a way to regulate the financial classes. Cause if you think about it, the average degree, if you want to make uh, good money, at least six figures, you're gonna be a hundred or two hundred thousand in debt, and then coming out, you're not gonna. It's not a guarantee that you're gonna find a job straight out unless you go to medical school or you had a good law school. If you take one of those, so then you then you uh hustling backwards. You in debt, you got to pay student loans back, or if you mm-hmm. didn't have a scholarship, you got to pay financial aid and all this other stuff. So, or and, it, and it it enslaves you into a job. It enslaves you into a job so that you don't have time to dream. You don't have time to create because you're under the, like you notice, I don't know if, you you know, now that I'm in my sixties, I see it more than ever. That's when people turn to painting. My sister became an artist at 50. Another friend of mine is winning contests. She started painting at 50 because you're so busy surviving, raising your kids, making sure there's food on the table, making sure there, that there's no time to, to, to dive into what do I want to do? What do I love to do? And to pursue your passions and your dreams. Yeah, you're, you're definitely right about that. So the transition into, um, I know I was, uh, reading into your book and, uh, what made you get into, uh, wanting to, uh, write a book and um, just basically, just um, basically, why did you pick to make a book about the uh, God of the impossible? Like, why, why did that have a strong, uh, why do you have strong feelings about that? Well, um, I, I have to be, confess and tell you, finances have always been my God because I just knew from a very young child that finances gave you choices. And, you know, so to give you a little bit of history where this, this, the book came from was um, when I was a child, my father was a multimillionaire. He built buildings. He was a developer. We lost all of it in one night. In one night, there was a mass shooting and you can look it up. It was called Fountain Valley five in the Virgin islands where eight people were murdered on a golf course. It made the front page of the New York Times and no one traveled to that island again for 10 years. The economy was like a bomb hit it. And then in the 1980s, the business came back. I was building up the business again and Hurricane Hugo hit. And Hurricane Hugo destroyed, I was in my mid 20s, so it destroyed my parents' finances. So in my early 30s, I was supporting My parents were divorced. I was supporting my mother independently at two or three K a month. I was supporting my father at two or three K per month. And I had a son with autism that was costing my family about 4,000 a month. So I had to make six to 8,000 a month just to support my loved ones. Now you can see where my passion for money comes from. I love to help and I love to give. And so I had built it up and bought several properties when the mortgage bubble hit. And I always said, I always was good at starting from zero. The mortgage bubble had me starting from a negative 1 million. Mm. I was actively in church, actively in church, praying, believing, declaring. I never got 
government assistance, not because of pride, but because I always believed. And I had many, many, many miraculous stories. Uh, a mysterious $7,000 check arrived in the mail from an old college friend that said, I've heard about your troubles because a friend of mine invited me to a college reunion and I burst into tears and said, I can't, I, 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 I can't. You know, my kids are sleeping on air mattresses. I have nothing. And then once I could go to the reunion, I said to myself, I said, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to the reunion. How do, how do I graduate from college and tell everybody I have no money? You know, I'm a disaster. You know, the shame kicked in. So I realized I'm not how much I earn. I'm not my profession. I am who I am. And I went to the reunion and I had a great time. Now getting to the book. We lost it all. I had a son hospitalized from hunger, no, no money in the house. And my pastor was preaching on order my steps, guide my steps. So I put the phone down in front of me and I prayed, order, guide my steps, God. I'm a realtor without a car. My car had been repossessed, order my steps. Well, within seconds of that prayer, my neighbor was screaming, screaming, screaming. I thought she was being raped. I ran down. I lived on a third floor. She lived on the first and she was holding her dead child. Now the book is about the series of the uncanny circumstances. It's a 32 page book that took me 10 years to write because you can't explain the supernatural. You can't explain the supernatural. I grabbed the dead child. I start to run with the dead child through a series of very uncanny events. It's so uncanny, I'll give you one of them out of about 10. A police officer helped us. Police station is near my house. He ended up taking the baby to the hospital. We went to thank that police officer and they went in the records and they said there was no man on duty that day. It was a female officer. We're like, well, a man officer was because we wanted to say thank you to him. And that was just one of the very uncanny things. Um, and what the Lord showed me after this, because the baby came back to life after being declared dead through a, you know, a little twitch here and a little twitch there it came back. To, it took a village to, 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 for this baby to survive. I don't want to get into the story it, it, because it, not, not because you won't read the book, but I don't want to give it not in order. And um, when I was driving to the hospital to check on the baby, God said to me, if your car was not repossessed, the baby would be dead. I was the only neighbor home. She was in the house, the baby had drowned in the bathtub and she was in the house with a three-year-old and a one-year-old and the three-year-old had pushed the one-year-old under the water and she couldn't move. She couldn't move because she had the three-year-old in the tub and she had the other baby dead in her arms. And um, there was about five of us. One woman gave CPR and the baby came back to life. But what it taught me more than anything is you can't present any challenge to me. There is no challenge too big for God. But what people don't understand is you have to believe. You know, I, I had a guy call me the other day. He's 59. He's overweight. His wife is leaving him for a younger man. And he's like, Molly, there'll never be another person for me. I'm 59. I'm overweight. I'm unattractive. I was like, you don't understand. You don't understand how God can change things, how God can rearrange circumstances. I've seen a dead baby come back to life. I've seen it. I've seen praying and believing and declaring after, after the doctor looked at me in my eyes and said, we regret to inform you this baby is already dead. What you're seeing now is the baby's twitching, but the kidneys have already failed, the organs are already dead, and this is just a typical process. And you know, I was with a, a friend that I had called to the hospital and she said, Molly, you don't understand because it was a translation involved. The doctor was speaking English and the lady only spoke Spanish. I couldn't translate. And my friend grabbed me by the arm and she's like, you don't understand. We have already declared victory on this baby. This baby isn't going anywhere. And let me tell you, between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m., not only did the baby come back to life completely healed, running up and down the hallways of the hospital. And when you see something like that, I, I mean, I still shake, my eyes water, my body starts when I start talking about this, because it's a story that happened in 2007. And when I tell it, I see it, I feel it like it happened yesterday. Yeah, that's that's deep. 
I yeah, that's real interesting. I um uh, I I haven't got a chance to read the whole read it some of it. But um I have a lot of books on my phone, so like I read I read when I get like idle time sometimes when I'm sitting at home. So I'm gonna finish I'm gonna finish the book just to see because I, I like the title of the book. Like I like anything dealing with God, so you know, I uh that that what really caught me when I first uh looked at it on Amazon. And you know, there's there's no such thing, you know, when 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 Val and I did the that you're calling me from from that meeting, you know, I never or I forced myself never to look at the numbers. Oh, there's six people on, there's eight people on, there's ten people on. You know, we are so caught up in what our weight is and what how many followers we have and how many likes we have and how many comments we have whereas that i remain try to focus on the, the irrelevance of it w what's relevant is what our daily connection is with god and who god puts in our path just for that day that we don't have to minister to thousands in big um, arenas that god can use you just one-on-one -on -one. okay so as far as um how long has this uh when did you publish this book and do you have any other books that's out no um the the next one i'm working on um is 101 ways to 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 make money i'm trying to say it more eloquently um because i just think that especially children and teens need to realize they have gifts and talents and that when we're soaked up in a phone all day, I don't know about you, but I, I, sometimes I'm ashamed. I get my thing on Sunday morning. It says you, your average time is 10 hours a week, 10 hours a day, 10 hours a day on a phone. And we can justify that's for business. It's, I'm listening to music. I'm exercising, whatever, whatever. But when we can learn to generate income online, such as write a book or write a class and put it on out, out school, when we generate income, my mother, I'm trying to work something with my mother who's in her 80s. It's not just for the income. It validates us. We, we, when we produce and we see someone that in, is enjoying what we produce, it gives us self-esteem, validation, and also financial autonomy that we can start making decisions without fear. Yeah, that, that's that's very true. So, so um, do you have I expect a release date for the next book and uh, without telling too much, what, what is uh, the next book based on, based around? It, it's going to be based about ways that teens and young adults and people without much of an education can make money. Um, you know, we have a story here in Puerto Rico where a couple came to Puerto Rico and didn't speak Spanish. And that was one of my excuses when I first got here. Oh, well, I can't work. I don't speak Spanish. They started a cleaning company. They started cleaning houses. They started cleaning apartments. They started cleaning, cleaning till they got government contracts for big buildings. When you put passion into anything you do, you will see that you will get recommended and referred and you can make a full-time living from it. Yeah. Yeah, I just find it, like anybody, I, uh, I interviewed uh, Randy, uh, um, he, I think that was about two months ago. He's an author too, because I know you know uh, Valerie. He's be he be working with Valerie too, and uh, I'm real intrigued because I don't run into a lot of people that that uh, writes books. You know, like I know music musicians and stuff like that, just because I do security for uh, executive security and security for uh celebrities on the side. So I run into those type of people all the time, but it's rare you run into somebody, you know, that they can write a whole book. Cause I, I feel, uh, I feel like that don't, the art of writing a book don't get shed on enough as far as like appreciating, you know, first off, how, how difficult it is, you know, cause you know, um, there's a lot of people, I feel like a lot of people that become su successful actors, just like with your background, wasn't the big brainiac. You know what I'm saying? Like it just, like it came natural to him and it's authentic. 
well, everybody has a book inside of them. And Valerie, there's no greater person that I've ever met that can extract that book from you. And that's Valerie. And the reason people are hearing about my book is I hired Valerie Adams because I didn't think it was done. I didn't feel like it was significant. I didn't feel like it was enough. I felt like it should be a longer book. It should be in more educated, more, you know, I just didn't feel it was done. And she read it and she said, what are you talking about, Molly? That book is done. And she's the greatest cheerleader, the greatest connector. And you have a book inside of you. You have amazing interview skills. You make me feel very relaxed. You make me feel authentic, important. Um, you know, you, you, you could just do a whole series on how to interview, right? You know, and she can extract that from you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, just to give you a little bit about my background, um, you know, um, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I uh, stayed there for most of my childhood, and I'm, I graduated from Addison, Alabama. And I joined. I was in the military for eight years. I got medically retired out of the military June of last year, and uh, been been Afghanistan twice. I was special forces for four years. Wow. So, so I I was like the top of the top as far as elite soldiers. I jumped out of airplanes, repelled out of helicopters, I had the same training as a, a Navy SEAL as far as hand uh, fighting styles and you know uh, marksmanship with weapons. And uh, I've been doing security for high profile people for two years now, and I also uh, I started this podcast in April of last year, right a month before I got out the military and a month after the pandemic started. And I was just like, I got a lot of time on my hands since they had shut everything down. Cause in, I'm, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. Now we was one of the first States to shut down. So we, I was just like, Hey, what am I going to do? I can't go to the gym and play basketball. Cause I had scholarship for basketball in high school. So I just, it still enjoy playing in my spare time. And uh, I couldn't do that couldn't really work out like that unless you worked out at home so i just found i was like man let me just start a podcast and you know i, I did start it with a friend but uh uh that didn't work out just because uh he didn't uh want to put the effort as far as promoting it wasn't that personal but i just started just wanted to do it by myself and um i just kept on with it you know i just i you know, interviewed a couple of music artists and and um, a couple people, uh, a couple things I like to do real topics too. Like my um, my two most popular topics right now is uh, one I did on fake friends, and uh, one uh, I did on uh, Jenna Rose and a relationship that was on the same episode. And then I did police brutality. That episode got so powerful that they put one of my friends off the episode because I guess he was talking about something. He was talking about something from the NCAACP with a what they had to do with Malcolm X and. And it got so X-rated. It was stuff that I didn't even know that they put him off the episode. And I couldn't even put him back on. I was trying to send him links to get back on. They would not let him wow. back on. So wow. I, that, that's how I know, like, people be listening to our conversations. But, you know, uh, I talk about real stuff. You know, we talked about uh, – I don't talk about politics as much, but we did deep, deep, uh, dig into it when it was just kept getting put in our face when Trump was getting out of office, you know, so, but, uh, yeah, I'd like to use this as a platform just for like anything. Like you can hit me up anytime you feel something that you feel passionate about. It don't have to be about, you know, nothing that you got going on, just a general topic, you know, that people might run into in their everyday life. You know, I get that, uh, opportunity. Anybody just hit me up on my phone or on Instagram and, you know, we strike up an episode like that. I just think it's great what you're doing. You're just giving so many people a voice. Yeah. So I, I read up on your, uh, your son too. One of your sons was the uh, 2021 Latin power players executive of the year. Yes, 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 yes. And he's, he's, I, I, Hope and pray there's a movie about him one day because he literally, literally, literally started with a handful of quarters. He started his same business when I told you that, you know, I had a son hospitalized from hunger. He wasn't the one, but he paid his own school. How he got started was he threw parties at like $10 a ticket 
to pay for his school and he'd get a band and he, um, you know, he just knew that we couldn't provide anymore and he had to start providing for himself. And that's how he, um, at age, he's as, as early as 14, 15, 16, he started going to the studio and going to the studio and he went 10 years without making a penny, 10 years. I would say to him, you know, what are you doing out till four in the morning? Working, working. I was like, what kind of blank, blank job do you have that you work till four in the morning and I don't see any money? Working, working, working. So it was 10 years of complete and utter grind from age 14 to about 24. And then he connected with the number one Latin artist and he wasn't the number one Latin artist at the time. He was a bagger in a grocery store, but he heard his music and liked his name and was off to the races and, uh, you know, really had their first huge success in 2017. So they've grown very, very rapidly. Yeah, that is one, oh, what Yeah, is it's your... am amazing. And one of the things I love to say, love to say about him is more, I'm more proud of how he handles success than his success. He's very humble. He's very generous. He's very kind. He's very empathetic. I mean, he's just a really wonderful person. Yeah, you rarely run into people like that because anybody, you know what I'm saying, not to make it financial, but, you know, anybody, you hand them a million dollars and, you know, they just come into an a-hole and get real arrogant and forget where they came from, forget when they only had $10 in their pocket. You know, so. Yeah, I, th I think I think he just saw us suffer for so long that, um, you know, I, I told him the other day when he was telling me about another deal he's making, I looked him right in the eye and I said, you know that's God, right? He says, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, and uh, he's, he, he's, he's just, yeah, like you said, he, he, he doesn't forget where he comes from and he really manages not to get, uh, dis, you know, caught up in that, all that. And and they and he's smart. I mean, they are they're smart. Maybe it's just a new generation. You know, they like to do investments and they like to do deals. And you know, it's all about building and growing. Yeah, I would have to say, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure you had time to reflect on this, but I'm pretty sure, you know, for him to get that level of recognition, you know, his, he, his, um, your work after have had the world buff on him, you know, watching as he was growing up as a child, watching all the stuff that you was diving into, you know, for him to be that persistent for 10 years without making a penny, you know, a lot of people couldn't probably go a couple months without seeing some results before they start trying to, uh, yeah. dig into something else, but you have to be real, persistent and have real determination about and belief in yourself for you to go that long knowing that hey yeah. this is gonna work you know you know um his father's from the middle east i'm originally from new york raised in the caribbean and he lives in a latin country so he has arabic blood he has american irish and i feel like those cultures all kind of melted together in him and he has an uncle who always said to him, you're not Latin, you're not Puerto Rican, because he's American born in Puerto Rico. And yet this kid, you know, he is, you know, his award is Latin executive. He's completely Latin, but he can be thrown anywhere and assimilate into the environment. And, you know, it was it was just, as we say, you know, the perfect storm. And that this is a very important point, Eric, that I'm really glad you brought up. We lost everything in Hurricane Hugo in the American islands, the Virgin Islands. I was pregnant with Noah and how he got his name was making it through the storm because we were suddenly relocated to, to Puerto Rico and we named him Noah because my friend stayed in the Virgin Islands and her baby passed away, was born in a tent. So he got his name for making it through the storm. And I had 600 people at my wedding in the Virgin Islands came here, didn't speak the language, couldn't work. I was pregnant, you know. Worst year of my life is when I opened the Bible and, be, and God became my best friend. And he said to me a year ago, mom, I'm so glad Hurricane Hugo happened. Now we're talking about the worst and darkest period of my life. And he said, because if it hadn't, we wouldn't have relocated to Puerto Rico and I wouldn't have what I have today. 
So that's where I say about God of the impossible, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, that you, you can bring anything my way. And I know that I know that I know that things will work out for the good. But as I told you from the beginning of the podcast, you have to believe. And you talked about his, his dream and working it for 10 years without any results. He counsels his friends all the time who they're depressed, they're discouraged, they're mad. And he said, mom, I'm amazed at how many people don't know what they want. Like he wasn't going to let anything stop him. He knew what they want. But when he asked his friends, what are your goals and dreams? They don't know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people just go through the motions. And a lot mm -hmm. of people, a lot of people, which is kind of like, uh, I would say a percentage of it is into you know, how our world is set up with the social media. You know, a lot of people spend their time uh, seeking validation from people on social media that don't even know them personally. That's it, it. Just, it just soaks up a lot of the time in their day and they can't invest other time into improving themselves. So, and they, or finding out, you know, what they want to do, what they do in their life or future goals. So I can see how that can happen. But um, as far as um, you, um, you don't have a target date for your next book, right? It'll be out before Christmas. the The goal is December one. Okay, then that's right around the corner, and it's going to be on Amazon as well. Yes, yes, and I'll send you all the information. It's going to be a hundred and one ways to to earn income. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I really, I really enjoyed this because uh, uh, normally, you know, I uh, I get on here and it just be with you know regular people and we just chopping it up about different topics that I thought of that that I think we can get a great conversation out of just barbershop talk. But you know, uh, it ain't a lot of people. You know, I would say authors is probably one of the lowest as far as numbers as far as like people that does that in the world to me like I, you rarely run into people that write books you know so the, i would say that's like a less than i i would think it would be less than one percent you know what i want you to write a book about how, how to start a podcast that's one of my dreams and I, I i a friend of mine did it during the pandemic on on this same platform and i'm it looks it looks easy, but on the other hand, it's like, you know, I wouldn't know where to begin. Oh, no, I can walk you through it. It's, a, it's not that hard. Because uh, the app that I do, um, they're, um, they sponsor it, and they distribute it on uh, 10 different platforms. But the only reason that I gear mine towards Spotify now is because I like to add music to the end of my episodes. And the only person that they um, partner with as far as music uh, agreement is Spotify. So if you add music at the end of the episode, uh, it's going to only show on Spotify. It's not going to show on the other platforms just due to copyright issues and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah, it wasn't that hard, you know. Um, you know, I, um, I found this app on... Uh, on Facebook, I was just scrolling one day because I look at podcasts all the time. I look at the Breakfast Club, you know, Secret to Success podcast with Eric Thomas, that motivational speaker. I, I listen to him every day in the morning. He's like the top motivational speaker in the country. He goes speak at all the colleges and all the pro teams and stuff. And uh, it wasn't – I don't – it. It was just random when I started doing this, you know, like there wasn't nothing that I even thought about as a kid or any time in my adult life. It was just something random. Like I was like I was having a conversation with my friend and I just moved on it. It wasn't then no thought into it really. And I just kept doing it. I love it. So uh do you have any uh last remarks as far as like any uh future things that you wanna put out? And also, you can, uh, any current things that you have going on, too, that you're working on, and also all your social media stuff, you know, you can uh, give people the links to that and um, the links to 
whatever you're uh, selling. And also uh, any special shout outs to people that uh, that you uh, deal with every day. Well, of course, I'd love to give a shout out to Valerie Adams. And if anybody, I, I believe everybody has a book inside of them and she can definitely extract that from you. And as far as other projects, what's really been on my heart lately, for some reason, I got three calls in one day. And I just believe that, uh, that people get into relationships with others. I would love to be able to give some dating advice or something. I just feel like there's so many people that settle. I feel like um, you, 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 you take what's in front of you because it's comfortable instead of severing it and moving on. And I just think that's what leads to domestic abuse and, you know, uh, just unhealthy relationships that we, I think, again, getting back to the subject of fear. And I just want to tell people when, when they always ask me for advice or they're having relationship problems and, you know, I just, just, the bottom line is don't settle. Don't settle in your career. Don't settle in your relationships. You know, there's an expression, you can't have it all. I think you can have it all. I really think you might not have it all at once, but I think you can have it all. Okay. And um, you, do you have any current things going on that I um, don't know about? Nope, just pretty much working on that book right now, the, 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 the ways to generate income, just because I think with the assistance, the government assistance kind of waning away after the pandemic and people are going to be in a lot of debt with their houses. And I just want to encourage people like you, just encourage people, you know, how to make a podcast or, you know, we all have, I, I say we're ATMs, we're all ATM machines. We just have to find our pin code to figure out how to get the cash out of us. Um, and it's a topic that, why I think I have such an adverse feeling about college is they never teach you how to monetize every, any, anything, anything. Um, you know, whether you become a lawyer, a doctor, business person, you can take all the business classes in, in the world. You're studying theory, theory, theory. You know, when is a college gonna open with, with practical skills and ideas? And that's why I believe more in, um, trade, not trade school, but trainings, like, you know, listening to your favorite motivational speaker or, or seeking out, if you want to write a book, finding someone that's written a book, or, you know, I love to take courses that are teaching me something, a skill or a talent or, or something that you can monetize. And I think that's where colleges just kind of drop the ball because they were gearing you up for a job. But then when corporations started to diminish, they never picked up the slack and how to, how to, you know, make your own money and how, and how to manage your money and, and just not to depend on the government. Yeah, that's bad. That's very true. A lot of people, like I said, uh, like I was talking to my friend a couple of weeks ago about this. I was like, you know, we was talking about music artists before we get off of here. I, I know you'll probably get uh, agree with this too. You know, in any music genre or any superstar from the seventies to like early two thousands era. I feel like those was real superstars because anybody that became a big public figure in that era or even before then early 1900s too, you really had to get out here and hustle. You had to like, you know, sell CDs in the street, you That's know, right. do, do posters on at businesses stuff like that. They, they didn't have social media to lean on and go viral off something and automatically get a big audience from people all across the world. So, and they didn't have a lot of multi-billion uh, companies that was back in the meter. Like they had to get out and make their own fan base. So I, uh, I feel like with the pandemic last year, that really brought out who's the real hustlers. Like the people that grew up in the 90s or 2000s or before then, they knew how to operate without social media. Even me, I had social media probably uh, not half of my life, probably like 10 years of my life. Mm -hmm. But most of my life, I didn't have it. So I know how to operate without it, but I mean, I take advantage of it just because it's a tool. But a lot of people don't know how to do anything outside of social media because well, that's all know, they know. You, 
but you want to know something? You just said something interesting. You know how to take advantage of it. They don't know how to take advantage of it because they know no different. You know, they don't know the old system of having to make flyers and banners and a hustle from business to business and sell CDs. You know, they, they, maybe they don't value it because it's, it's, it's just so normal to them. Yeah. Yeah. The, the pandemic really brought out who was the, the real go getters, who was the real hustlers. Mm-hmm. Because because it wasn't they some people income screen got taken away and it's like all right what you gonna do you just gonna sit here and go broke or are you gonna figure out a way to get out here you know what I'm saying and make a way that's right you have to re- reinvent yourself for sure but yeah I really I really enjoyed this and um um if there's any way you know um you can give uh. I would like to do an episode with your son, you know, because he has a, uh, I read his uh, story on the billboard thing um, last, uh, this uh, Friday is when I read that. And uh, he has a very interesting uh, thing too. Yes, yes, yes. I really hope to connect you right now. He's being bombarded, of course, you know, with, with different, all kinds from, from everywhere, from everywhere he's being bombarded, but um. Yeah, as soon as things quiet down, certainly I'll do my best to connect you guys. Okay, that sounds good. And uh, this wraps up the uh, Eric J. The Great Podcast. I bet I really appreciate you uh, coming on. And um, this uh, um, episode should be on Spotify within the next hour or so. I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to write the description now and uh, publish it now. That sounds great. You've been so great. All right. I appreciate you coming on. You have a good night. You too. God bless. Bye.